Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge and welcome to Eldridge and Company. Ever since massive protests last month in, in Cuba, I have been looking for someone to talk to about it because there's so much about our Cuban policies that I find almost silly, but unfortunately they're a disaster. Um, and I'm very lucky that I found uh, Professor Perez, Lissandra Perez. He's a professor of sociology at John Jay College, the largest uh, Latin America and Latina studies in the in the CUNY system, right? I'm actually, uh, I'm a sociologist by training, but I'm in the uh, Latin American and uh, Latinx studies department at uh, John yeah. Jay College. Yeah, I guess I didn't do the Latinx, but it's all right. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> and you, you're a perfect guest because you were born in Havana. Uh, your family moved to Florida. You went to school in Florida, college, taught in Florida and everything. Um, in between, you went, you were a professor at Louisiana. Is it State University or you? LSU, yes, in Baton Rouge. Where you this, have. This is, this is where I started my career. I moved back to Miami. I got a position at Florida International University. And uh, I chaired the Department of Sociology there. And then I established the Cuban Research Institute which I directed there for about 13 years. And it's still uh, going. It's the premier center for the study of Cubans and Cuban Americans in the United States. You go back and forth to, come to Cuba. How have you been able to lead, take students to Cuba? Did you do that just last year? I did that just before the pandemic struck in January of 2020. Okay. And I, that was the third time I, I did it. I took CUNY students uh, in 2015 and 2016, and then again in uh, January of 2020. So could you do that because you're from Cuba? I mean, haven't no. we, hasn't there been a restriction on travel? No, there's a restriction on travel. Well, one of the exceptions to those restrictions are students that are enrolled in a four credit course. Oh. So that's even uh, true to this day. What, what is, what is uh, of course, uh, discouraging uh, study abroad courses in Cuba is the pandemic. But in terms of both U.S. regulations and also Cuba, uh, uh, courses that are for credit, and the U.S. specifies that, for credit courses uh, can still be uh, taught in Cuba. And this was a faculty-led course. Uh, in, in each one of those occasions, I took about a dozen or so CUNY students, and they weren't just John Jay students. And um, I, I did it in the uh, first two times I did it was in the summer, but then I got smart and did it, did the last one in January, which is a lot better in terms of the weather. Are they lucky? This is what I want to ask, basically. Are we as a country still considering Cuba a danger to us? And do the Cuban ruling class, and I don't quite know which to call it, all the different parts of it, do they really feel um, the same way reciprocally? I mean, why are why are, why do we have the policy we have? Well, that's that's a that's a that, that requires a very long answer. Uh, I think that <laughs> yes, uh, the United States government uh, considers uh, has labeled uh, Cuba as a hostile state. It treats it that way. Uh, the Trump administration put Cuba back on what it calls the state terrorist list, which are the uh, states that it considers promote terrorism. And they that in it, excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt you, but they re put it on, right? I yes, think it was Obama on before. I think it was placed, uh, let's see, it must have been placed on, a, I, would, I believe, in the late, uh, in the early, two, during the Bush administration, uh, the second Bush administration. So um, the, the, the young people Bush administration. So uh, that was taken off during the Obama years. And there was a rapprochement uh, during the Obama administration in which Obama himself visited Cuba. Uh, things looked like uh, they were going to be improving for the first time in something like 50 years uh, or so. And uh, again, with the Trump administration, things went back uh, to uh, a relationship of hostility uh, in which uh, we are now um, you know, position in such a way that uh, both uh, countries are still distanced from each other. And the Biden administration, to the frustration of many who felt that he had promised uh, to a return to the Trump administration, uh, to the, excuse me, to the Obama administration policies, has not done so. And, uh, and so still the, uh, the Biden administration has to take 
has yet to take any substantive steps uh, that will improve relations with Cuba. Now, I haven't answered your original question, which is why are, why, why are relations so poor? Let me just, it, 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 I think my conclusion is it comes down to a basic political question that people, it's a whole question of older Cubans who emigrated to this country, right? At the time of Castro and the political power they have in the administrations. Is that oversimplifying the whole thing? I think it's broader than just uh, older Cubans who left at that time. Uh, I think that, for example, uh, presently, uh, there's been polls done on the Cuban American community that found that even some of the more recent arrivals from Cuba, say over the past 20 years that have arrived, are also supporting somewhat hardline policies uh, towards Cuba. So it's not just the older Cubans, those older Cubans who came at the time of the conflict internally in Cuba in 1960, 61 have now mostly passed. Uh, but the uh, culture of anti-Castroism, of anti-communism, of, of isolating Cuba, of hostility towards Cuba continues essentially to, uh, to exist. And I think it has a lot to do also with the culture of Cuban Americans, the political culture, which uh, has survived through more than one generation of hostility towards the Cuban government. And I think that's in many ways part, it's not just, it's not just a, a it's part of a political culture in, 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 in among Cubans in, in the United States. Not, that is not to say it's a monolithic uh, view. Mm -hmm. I think there are many Cuban Americans like myself and many others that I know uh, that actually do favor a policy of of uh, easing uh, the uh, hostilities between the two countries. Just makes such common sense. I mean, that's what I don't understand. We both depend on each other. If we had the openness, we did. Does the current government in Cuba really think, and especially after the demonstrations, the protests, really think they can sustain the current political atmosphere there without doing different things? Uh, Yes, I think they do, actually. <laughs> they, uh, they are not, I think, you know, part of what we have to understand here is that in this case, if we want to talk about the extremes, that is on the left, if we want to put the Cuban government there and on the right, the U.S. government, uh, and also the, uh, the uh, hardline uh, segments of the Cuban American community, the extremes touch on this. In other words, it's a case where Frequently, you find what are the two most, you know, diametrically opposed uh, positions, uh, actually uh, agreeing on a lot of things, uh, which have to do, for example, with um, not wanting a lot of openness. The Cuban government, at times, has been also been complicit in uh, keeping things closed because uh, an openness such as that which President Obama initiated does threaten uh, the. Um, uh, the survivability of the Cuban government. Let me just give one example. Uh, during the visit of uh, President Obama to Cuba, he held a press conference jointly with uh, President Raul Castro. That was the first time that Raul Castro had ever held a press conference with, you know, uh, with press from around the world. And it placed him in an uncomfortable position. And, and I think that the policies of opening are things that facilitate um, a greater dialogue, a greater understanding. And the Cuban government frequently does not want things to change. And so sometimes it, 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 it sort of uh, also uh, contributes a bit to keeping things isolated. Now, that being said, uh, I think obviously the Cuban government has uh, favored the lifting of the embargo. Uh, the embargo is something that does keep the Cuban government uh, from um, being able to more fully trade with the world. But uh, it also gives the Cuban government, I might add, the excuse for why things are bad in Cuba. It's the explanation is the embargo of the United States, which of course is not uh, accurate. There are many other factors that go into why Cuba is in such uh, dire economic straits uh, that many other people do want change. And they want change because their lives uh, uh, again, are very difficult right now. Why, why are they in such dire circumstances economically? 
the pandemic. I, I think that part of it is uh, that um, there's there's a, there's a few things that, that have happened. One is I think the Cuban government has been very uh, reluctant uh, to really allow for a great deal of private enterprise in Cuba. And uh, the state uh, uh, controls most of the, again, means of production that's changed. Uh, and you might say that's okay, except uh, you have to be competent. And I think the Cuban government lately has not been competent in dealing with a lot of things that affect the population. And uh, with Fidel Castro gone, his brother presumably retired, uh, there's a new president, and uh, a lot of Cubans do not believe that he is competent, quite apart from ideological reasons. That is, uh, many of the people in the Cuban community in the United States argue that this is a question of freedom and liberty, which it may be for, for many people. It's also a question that a lot of Cubans are, 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 are questioning whether their government is really do acting in their best interest. And for example, uh, with respect to the pandemic, right now, uh, the pandemic as it is in the US is you know, uh, running rampant in Cuba. Uh, this despite the fact that the Cubans have developed their own vaccines and that's praiseworthy. But at the same time, they don't have an effective distribution network apparently, and they don't have a lot of the material resources. For example, they don't have enough syringes. So, so it's a question that, again, uh, healthcare is one of the things that the Cuban government most um, is most proud of, presumably. And yet, right now, the Cuban health system is in dire straits. And a lot of Cubans believe this is just a question of incompetence uh, on the part of their government. Are there free elections there? How does that happen? Uh, the way the elections take place in Cuba, the, the, the reason they're not, we don't consider them in this country free elections, per se, is that only members of the Communist Party uh, may uh, occupy office. Um, in other words, Cubans vote. Uh, they vote in local elections for different candidates who are members of the party. Right? And they go to a national assembly and that national assembly is the one that votes in the government and the council of state and so forth. Uh, so there are elections in Cuba, uh, but of course there, it's a unit party system. Uh, and so therefore you don't have uh, candidates that are outside of the membership of the communist party. It's how do you become a member of the communist party? Well, uh, you apply, you, uh, I, I'm not sure what exactly the process is, but uh, presumably do you have merits that you have to prevent for being a member of the party. Uh, and, uh, and you can assume that most officials, in fact, I, I, I dare say all officials of the government, uh, all the way down to the local level, are members of the party. And that is the, the system, that is the system of mobility within Cuba, right? Mm. The Cuban of the party. So if your parents were members of the party, chances are you were brought up as a member of the party? Well, now we're getting into issues of intergenerational rebellion, <laughs> which, which uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that it follows. Uh, I, uh, I think that uh, there are a lot of individuals that I know of that are members of the party and very loyal to the government uh, in Cuba whose children live outside of Cuba, for example. So I, I'm not sure I want to reach a conclusion about intergenerational change. But that the 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 youth of um, of Cuba uh, is a hopeful thing for making it less repressive, right? Well, let me. Uh, I think that one factor that we haven't talked about with respect to why things are as um, let's say um, now it's come to the forefront, all these uh, demonstrations and so forth, and that has to do with social media. Uh, I do think that uh, social media has made a difference this time in, in how the way in which the opposition of, in Cuba has expressed itself. And I think that, again, as happens in this country, a great deal of social media is in the hands of young people who have used it to share their concerns about the nature of the government among themselves and who've also used it to organize. Uh, these, uh, uh, on June 11th, when these uh, demonstrations uh, started, um, it was an isolated at first incident in one locality. But then of course through social media it spread throughout the country and pretty soon you had different, as many as 60 localities I understand throughout the country that had demonstrations. So we can't underestimate 
you know, life has been hard in Cuba. The Cuban government has had its system in place for many decades, uh, and the U.S. government has had its embargo in place for many decades. So those factors don't explain exactly what's happening now. What's happening more now is more immediate. The situation is economically is more acute, and there are more ways in which people in Cuba can express their discontent with the government and get organized. The, the Cuban government also uses the internet and the so social media to the, trying to turn it to their advantage, right? Uh, well, yes, they have various media methods of, uh, of communicating, of course. Uh, it's interesting that they shut down the internet uh, right after the demonstration of June 11th, so they uh, do control that. The embargo, that was that was placed, that was from Jack Kennedy's administration, yes. right? Yes. After, after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yes. Yeah, because a lot of people don't really understand. Yeah, it's that originally the, the, uh, the idea of the embargo, presumably, uh, was because Cuba had confiscated so many U.S. properties. And, uh, and again, the, the Kennedys thought to, uh, after the failure of the Bay of Pigs especially, sought to bring some pressure on Cuba uh, by essentially depriving it uh, of, of, of foreign commerce. Uh, and that was the purpose of it. But it's been used since then for many, the, the maintaining it has been used for many other, with many other pretexts. For example, when Cuba uh, went into Africa in the 1970s, uh, its army went into Africa. Uh, it was the, the embargo was maintained presumably because of Cuban adventurism in Africa, uh, and now it's being maintained because with the pretext that uh, well the Cuban government is uh, you know a totalitarian and it oppresses its people and so forth and so it's now being kept on for reasons that presumably have to do with the nature of their political system. That right. wasn't originally why it was placed on. I mean, that's why we have the, the Republicans. Well, it's not only just the Republicans. Menendez in, from New Jersey, who mm -hmm. is Cuban by birth, is taking a lead, I think, in, in being more restrictive, you know, as is the governor of Florida and the um, senator. But uh, that's a question of people, what they think about how they're going to, of legislatures and legislators and their roles, but um, I've read the different descriptions of Cuba as socialist and as communist. Is it a hybrid? Uh, again, uh, even it's, they, in Cuba, they, they call, talk about socialism. They don't talk about communism because if you're a true communist, you don't, you know, socialism is a step towards communism and, and, and presumably um, it's difficult to reach that stage. They call themselves communists by ideology, but their system is socialist. John Jay has the largest population, Hispanic population of many colleges, right? It's it is the, uh, not only let's Hispanic, see. but minority, right? Yes, minority particularly. We, uh, we uh, ourselves in Lehman uh, are the two uh, senior institutions in the Northeast with the largest number of Latin, Latino or Latinx students. Um, how many students of Cuban descent do you think you have? Do you oh, have very few. In, 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 no, in John Jay College and CUNY in general, the, the, uh, the Cuban population of uh, New York uh, used to be very large uh, in comparison with other Latin American populations. In fact, the, the book that I recently published um, uh, what is oh, on the Cuban community in sugar, sugar oh. cigars, and revolution, the making of Cuban New York. Here we go. Great. It's uh, 2018 New York University Press, and they just put out a paperback edition a few months ago. And By the way, it also was published, translated, and published in Cuba. Uh, and so, it's got great, got great reviews. Thank you. In the 19th century, uh, Cubans were by far the largest uh, Latin American group in, the, in New York. Um, and it was probably, that was probably true through about the 1930s. Uh, right now, Cubans are only about the, uh, I believe, uh, I looked it up recently in the census, and there are eight uh, Latin American nationalities that have more uh, of its population in New York than do Cubans. So uh, Cubans were especially important also when the revolution first uh, uh, occurred in 1959 and the years thereafter in which there, were a significant, there was a significant Cuban population in Manhattan, in Queens, and in uh, New Jersey. 
but many of those uh, Cubans have uh, moved uh, to Miami, uh, where there is now greater concentration of the Cuban population, about uh, roughly 65% of the Cuban American population uh, lives in Southern Florida. Is that right? That's yeah. interesting, isn't it? It's a whole, it's a whole another world. It's a whole culture difference from the rest. Well, it's uh, Miami is a, a what what we, we we call in sociology an institutionally complete ethnic community. That is uh, because of its size, because of the fact that it has a lot of professionals, people in all occupational levels. People can actually live out practically the entirety of their lives uh, within this uh, ethnic community in Miami, and uh, in many ways have very little contact with what we might call the dominant society. Uh, so that um, Miami feels to a Latin American very, very much like a Latin American city in which you hear literally Spanish everywhere. Yeah. And is it economically, do they do, is the Cuban population more prosperous than other Latina populations? Uh, actually, um, that used to be especially true in the 1970s, and I have written a few things about that in the 1970s and early 1980s, uh, when the group that predominated were the upper sectors of Cuban society. Uh, since that time, the Cuban American population has become a lot more heterogeneous mm. um, in terms of uh, socioeconomically. And a lot of studies that have been done, particularly by Professor Alejandro Portes at Princeton show that it's sort of a bifurcated community. That is, you have people who are very successful. Uh, on the one hand, you also have people, particularly those that have arrived more recently from Cuba, who have not been so successful. So it's, it's a more heterogeneous community. It's a very large community. We're talking about 1.3 million people that are of Cuban origin or descent uh, in the United States. Actually, I think the latest census figures even have it above that. Now, why is, we'll end with this, why is the so hostile to Cuba? Well, there's a, there's a, I think there's a couple of reasons uh, for that. Historically, and I think at the very beginning uh, of the Cuban revolution, uh, there was a tremendous amount of um, resentment, I think, in uh, the US government and I, when I'm talking about uh, individuals who were the policymakers, uh, starting first with the Eisenhower administration, uh, John Foster Dulles, Alan Dulles, that whole uh, foreign policy establishment felt that given the history of Cuba with the United States, that Cuba uh, had sort of betrayed the US by doing this revolution and essentially nationalizing US properties. Uh, Cuba had always been uh, a sort of a uh, child nation of the United States in which uh, some of the earliest uh, sort of uh, uh, new forms of US expansionism were tried out in Cuba with the Platt Amendment in 19, uh, you know, starting with the Cuban Republic in 1902. So essentially Cuba was like a child that had gone bad and, 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 and therefore it was like, um, like, you know, the kind of, it's very different than with a nation with whom relations were, was, were not as intimate as they were with Cuba. So I think there was that whole thing that Cuba was simply um, had betrayed the US in some way by going over to the socialist camp and being an ally of the Soviet Union. And also the idea that they posed a security interest, a security threat uh, so close to the United States. I think what's happened lately with respect to US Cuba policy, and I mean lately, especially since 1980 or so, is that the embargo is being maintained by electoral politics. That is, um, there is, I think, Carl Rove, who was the uh, advisor to the second uh, Bush president, mm -hmm. said uh, one time was quoted as saying, when people talk to me about Cuba, I think about three things, Florida, Florida, and Florida. So that sort of puts into light, especially the importance of Florida, the idea that uh, the Cuban American vote will be swayed uh, by uh, 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 hardline policies towards the Cuban government. And I think that more than anything else has been what has sustained a policy that otherwise does not make any sense except in this sort of political ideological context. Well, thank you. I think, I think with younger people and more people in the cultural field and other people, and I guess capitalists who want to invest in Cuba, though we want to have some sense that maybe the future is going to be a little better. 
Well, after observing this process for 50 years and, and not seeing any change, you'll forgive me if I'm a pessimist, right? And says, says that I, I certainly haven't seen it. Uh, and, uh, and again, I, I, I'm very skeptical of real change, uh, not only in Cuba, but in terms of US Cuba policy. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Professor. I wish I could go on the next tour that you have, but I don't even think I can. <laughs> be a, anything so well maybe we could work something out <laughs> okay. lots of good luck and uh, thank you very much great okay thank you for having me